Grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus who is indeed the Christ, the anointed one of God. And let us pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the day. It is a day that you have made and we rejoice in it. Lord, today we continue our study of the book of Revelation. We ask you, O oh Lord, to give us insight into that word. Uh, you've given me a word for today, not on many passages, but a word that needs to be heard. And so I pray, Lord, you would anoint my tongue to declare it today and anoint every ear that hears it to receive it and to understand it. And we just pray, Lord, that uh, as we just sang, you know, let your glory fall in this place. Let it go forth from here to the nations because the nations of the world, the peoples of the world need to hear that you are coming soon, Jesus. And so we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, we begin in chapter 14. We will not get far today, but that's okay. Chapter 14, we read, beginning at verse 6, And I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven, having the everlasting glad tidings to preach upon those dwelling on the earth and upon every nation and tribe and tongue and people, saying in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. And worship the one having made heaven and the earth and the sea and springs of water. This is from the Berean Literal Bible translation, and I find it interesting in that uh, these first couple of verses, it, sa it says here is like this preposition. Prepositions are very important. It gives you direction and so forth. And, 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 and so it says, they have the ever he has the everlasting glad tidings to preach upon the people. And I think that word, that uh, preposition upon, is very interesting because if you look at the perspective from where the angel is, he's flying above the heavens. He's not talking like I am to, to you. He's flying above, and so he's declaring the good news upon <laughs> the world. Makes perfect sense. So this angel is flying mid-heaven, and he's preaching the good news upon the people. And so it's just very, very interesting. But the next verse, I am speculating. And I will tell you up front, I am speculating. But it's a possibility, which is why you sometimes have to speculate. You know, when you think about the fact that you've got an angel of the Lord flying mid-heaven, declaring glad tidings to the earth, and saying fear God and give him glory and so forth because the hour of his judgment has come, worship the one having made heaven and the earth and so forth. I'm wondering if this angel is doing this because all forms of communication on the earth have been interrupted in some way. I know we don't want to think about that. You know, we're kind of fond of being able to communicate with people even across the world in a split second, right? Uh, but it is a possibility that we've got to consider that we are vulnerable to such things happening. We've talked about this before, but every single form of our communication except what I'm doing with you guys right now is dependent upon electricity. Every single bit of it is dependent upon electricity. And I know we know we're vulnerable. You know, just to have the lights go out just for a couple of hours, we go, oh, the lights are out in two hours. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's what we do, okay? But consider this. There was a solar storm in 1859. It's known as the Carrington event. It was a powerful geomagnetic storm. The sun released a coronal mass ejection, which hit the Earth, Earth's magnetosphere. And it induced one of the largest geomagnetic storms on record from September 1st to 2nd, 1859. 
The storm caused strong auroral displays and it played havoc with the telegraph systems at the time. I mean, telegraph operators, they got shocked sitting where they were, okay? So if a CME, which is a coronal mass ejection, if that brought havoc to something so simple as the telegraph systems in 1859, consider the trouble such a thing would make in today's complex electrical world. In 2012, we missed such an event by nine days. Now, how does it miss us? Well, if that mass ejection just isn't pointed in the right direction, it'll just fly by Earth, you know, just move on past Earth. And so what happened in 1859, it got us a biggie, okay? In 2012, it would have been a biggie, but it was directed away from Earth. But if one actually hit us, well, that would be a natural phenomenon, but it would cause all kinds of problems. You know, communication shut down everywhere. That's a natural phenomenon. Of course, we know that human beings can cause such things to happen, too. I mean, what have we been thinking about the last couple of years is EMPs, electromagnetic pulses. You know, those things can take out the grid. And unfortunately, we know that there are people who would just love to take out America's grid. In fact, what I understand is this is not America's grid, but apparently Russia has pointed an EMP-type device at some of our warships and rendered them incapable of operating for several hours. Well, that's not very good. It's like, come on, people. So that's like human, human-caused events, um, you know. And of course, we know that, well, that's, that's another thing. Another possibility for a human-caused event for shutting down the communications would be the complete, complete shutdown of the Internet. That would stop us from being able to communicate all over creation. Now, we hate to think all of our smartphones, all of our little walking computers that we carry all over creation, we would just hate that. But do you know that already now, shutting down bits and pieces of the Internet has already happened around America. It's probably happened in other places as well. But it appears that they're just kind of playing with it. You know, somebody's got, you know, control over this. It's all done via satellite. And so, you know, you get the wrong people in there or they make not so good decisions. And the next thing you know, we are kind of blind, can't see, things like that. It doesn't give us warm fuzzies to think about that. But anyway, now... There is another possibility, which would be a natural caused event that I want to talk about today. Gil Broussard is an amateur astronomer. You know, we think NASA does a lot of space, well, NASA does do a lot of space exploration. But oftentimes, it's the amateur astronomers that notice things that are out there. And then they phone their information into NASA, and NASA checks it out, and there you go. Well, and I've talked about this before, but not too much. Anyway, another way that our communication systems could go down is with the flyby of Planet 7X, otherwise known as Nibiru, otherwise known as the Destroyer. It has many names, but Gil Broussard seems to think that the governments of the world will shut down the internet probably as soon as spring of next year so that we can't communicate with each other about the whereabouts of where Planet X is. And um, all of this is, all of this is um, estimates, okay? estimates as to where planet X may be, because until we sight it, until the astronomers sight it, they can't measure where it is and how fast it's coming in. It's coming in, but how fast it's coming in is another story. 
But uh, Gil Broussard thinks that you know, the, the governments of the world will shut down communication so that we can't communicate with each other um, and you know, talk about what Planet X is doing and all that sort of stuff around the world and things like that. But eventually, it isn't going to matter what NASA does or the governments of the world does. Eventually, we're going to be able to see Planet X with the naked eye. Let me show you why. This is kind of difficult anyway, but Planet X, go, it flies by Earth on average once every 360 years. Okay? So it comes from way out here, way out here, and it does this elliptical orbit around Earth. It goes between Earth and the Sun. That's how close it's going to be. Okay? So it's going to fly by the Earth. So anyway, here you go. It's going to come on in here, and then shoot, right on out. Okay? So, uh, and the big thing here is right here, estimate, 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 estimate. Gil Broussard is very quick to say, we, all, of these, all of these dates that he has in here, which right now this one starts, we've got May of 2019, June 2019, and so forth, all the way in and then back out again. All of those are theoretical, theoretical until it's cited. In fact, I saw some information the other day where all of these were like 2016. He changes his charts based upon information he gets. Okay? And, uh, and so until there's a visual sighting, nobody knows. Now, what's interesting about Planet X is, um, is that uh, we know that this is the orbit based upon the fact that we have sightings, actual sightings of it, from its flyby in uh, 10,056 A.D. Let me show you that slide. Okay? Interestingly here um, is that, you know, here's the orbit. The slide is kind of di uh, differently put. But anyway, here, here on this side here, all of those are Beijing, China, uh, London, England, Constantinople, Turkey, Beijing, and so forth. All these little white dots represent places on Earth that spotted it and wrote it down in some official log. Okay? So based upon each place where they could see it, and notate it, these are astronomers seeing it and notating it, uh, then its orbit was calculated. Okay, so it's got this, this elongated elliptical orbit that uh, takes, on average, 360 years uh, to go. And so, uh, so, so it'll be seen probably a year and a half before it gets here, and then we'll still be able to see it a year and a half as it leaves. Okay, but it's this, it's this big old planet that causes all kinds of interesting things to happen. Now let me go to this one. All these little dots on this particular graph are events where Gil Broussard believes, biblically, you can see where Planet X did its flyby. Okay? He believes that uh, Noah's flood was in part affected by Planet X. He believes that lots, you know, the, the fire and brimstone that fell down on Sodom and Gomorrah, he believes that that was caused by Planet X. All of the plagues of Egypt, God used Planet X as his tool of judgment on the gods of Egypt at that time. Uh, Joshua's long day, remember Joshua said, sun stand still? And it stood still for 12 hours while he battled the Amalekites or whoever it was he was battling at the time. Well, that can only happen with some big body disrupting the Earth's orbit. And so, so that's like, okay, get over to, uh, let's see, Hezekiah asked, well, he was asked to ask for a sign. He said, well, it's one thing to, to, 
It's one thing to have the son go forward 10 steps. That's easy. He said, ask the Lord for a sign where the son would go back on the steps, 10 steps. That only happens if the planet's rotation here is disrupted enough to where it appears to go backwards. Okay? Um, Jesus' is, uh, when he was on the cross, remember there was a uh, there was an eclipse. The sun was dark and the moon did not give its light. The moon turned blood red for three hours. That's not normal. Okay? The moon uh, can only give maximally an, a total eclipse of seven minutes or so. And that eclipse lasted three hours. So, uh, so you know, the way Gil Broussard looks at these things, he, he reads the Bible with Planet X in mind, and because he is a, an astronomer and he is good at mathematics, and you have to be good at mathematics when it comes to astronomy, he has uh, looked at the various events in the Bible and based upon what the Bible has said, and he's done the calculations, and, and so he says, this is what it's gone by. He says, it's, it's coming by again. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's what we're thinking at this point, and of course that can disrupt a lot of things, uh, primarily because it's ha it has a debris field. It has a tail. You know, comets have tails. This is not a comet. This is a planet. And apparently it has like seven moons around it. But it has, uh, but it has, a, it has a debris tr tail. And Earth will have to go through that debris tr tail twice. And then, of course, you know, every year after that. The first time would be like, say, in the spring and then in the fall. Because it takes us that long to do our orbiting around the sun. But it's very interesting, and of course, you know, when you've got, um, uh, you know, something like that, and if you've got a debris tail that we have to go through, I mean, can you imagine the satellites in space? It's like, it's like, it's like going through shotgun pellets. You know, when you've got this debris trail coming through. So, so he thinks it's very possible that communications could be knocked out because of Planet X. And so, you know, we've got to think of those things. The good news, of course, is that even if communications are knocked out, okay, God has assigned an angel to declare the good news upon the earth. So that we're not going to be, the people of the earth are not going to be without the testimony of the fact that Jesus is God's son and God is the true God in heaven and he is the creator of all. So, you know, so all communications could be gone, but God is still proclaiming his good news. And that's a good thing. And of course, God's proclaiming his good news and of course then we still have to do our part of telling People explaining to people. Because they're, you know, when all this stuff happens, there are going to be a lot of people scratching their heads and being worried and all this sort of stuff. And we've got to go, folks, in Christ Jesus, you can have peace in the midst of the storms. Okay? So that's good. Now, another verse that we get to is verse 8. And that verse says, and another angel, a second angel, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, who has given all the Gentiles to drink of the wine of the passion of her immorality. Now, Babylon is mentioned 274 times in the Bible, 260 times in the Older Testament, 14 times in the Newer Testament, amazingly, 150 times in the book of Jeremiah. So what was Babylon, and why in the world is it mentioned in the book of Revelation? Well, first of all, Babylon was the capital city of the Babylonian Empire. Babylon became an empire when a fellow by the name of Nabopolassar, the father of Nebuchadnezzar, 
rebelled against the Neo-Assyrian Empire in 620 B.C. Now remember when you're talking B.C. A.D. B.C. you're you're going you're heading from like 620 down to zero instead of zero up to 2019. Okay, so 620 B.C. Anyway, and then. After his death, his son, Nebuchadnezzar, became king, and he ruled for 43 years. Regarding a description of Babylon and its worldwide influence, we read in Daniel 4, beginning at verse 10, Nebuchadnezzar has had a vision. And he's writing about it. Beginning at verse 10, he said, These were the visions of my, be- of my head while on my bed. I was looking, and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong. Its height reached to the heavens, and it could be seen to the ends of all the earth. Its leaves were lovely, its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it. The birds of the heavens dwelled in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. Now Daniel's interpretation of the vision is as followed. To Nebuchadnezzar he says, That tree that you saw, which grew and became strong, whose height reached to the heavens, and which could be seen by all the earth, whose leaves were lovely and its fruit abundant, and which was food for all, under which the the beasts of the field dwelt, and whose branches the birds of of heaven had their home. It is you, O king who have grown and become strong, for your greatness has grown and reaches to the heavens and your dominion to the ends of the earth. Okay? Inasmuch as the king saw a watcher, a watcher angel, a holy one coming down from heaven and saying, chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave its stump and roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven and let him graze with the beasts of the field till seven times pass over. And the interpretation was that Nebuchadnezzar had grown proud, thinking that he and he alone was the reason for Babylon's greatness. Okay? And so Daniel gives him some advice. And he says, he says, O king, let me advise you, you know, may it be acceptable to you, break off your sins and be righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity. What's interesting about that is Daniel is one of the captives from Israel and he is a captive in Babylon. But his advice to the king shows his concern for the king. You know, he's not thinking, well, great, something some finally is going to happen to Nebuchadnezzar. He's finally going to get his comeuppance. No, he's saying, turn from your, your wicked ways. Be, you know, do righteous things. Be good to the poor and so forth. And just maybe your prosperity will be lengthened. Well, all this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. The king spoke, saying, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? While the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed you, and you shall uh, drive, and they shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. Okay, which happened? He ate grass like the oxen for seven years. His hair grew like eagle's feathers, his claw, his fingernails like eagle's claws. His mind left him. Until He humbled himself before God and looked up to heaven and acknowledged God. This particular chapter in Daniel is his letter to all the peoples of the earth of what he experienced at the hand of the God of heaven. And he said, he is able to bring low the mighty, bring low the proud. 
So, we know what the description of, the, of Babylon was. I mean, it was a tree or, of, of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, you know. It was described in the vision as a tree that you could see and became strong. The height reached the heavens, could be seen all over the earth. Uh, the leaves are lovely, the fruit abundant. There was food there for all. The beasts of the field dwelt under it. And the branches, the birds of heaven had their homes. And so the question, of course, is why is it mentioned in Revelation? Babylon is long gone. You know, it went the way after the Medes and Persians came in. So why is it in the book of Revelation? I mean, could it be that in the end times, which I believe we're in the end times, could it be that there is a person and or nation which exists now that has the characteristics of Babylon? You know, uh, a person or a, a nation with great power, worldwide reach and influence, a place of beauty, producing food for all, a place of refuge and safety for birds and beasts, meaning, you know, those who desire to come under its shade. Is there a place such as that in the earth? today. Anybody got any guesses? You know, could it be America? Could it be America? I mean, I, I mean, I looked. I looked on the internet. See, I looked on the internet. Don't take my, my electricity away. I looked on the internet. America is the most powerful nation. America's economy dominates the world. America's military might is unparalleled. For better or worse, and sometimes for a lot worse, our culture influences the entire world. And is there any other nation in the world where millions of people flock to it, either legally or illegally? And I mean, I don't think there's any other nation in the world where people climb over fences or crawl under them or cross rivers or pay smugglers money to get into it. I mean, I don't hear that about but Russia. I don't see anybody going, uh, tunneling under to get to North Korea or China. You know? And people certainly aren't wanting to stay in Mexico or Honduras or Guatemala or all those places. They're leaving. They're all wanting to come here. Because they believe that here is where their shade is going to be. Okay? You know, I, I just think that America is uniquely suited to fit the description of Babylon. And there are a lot of people who think the same way. Unfortunately, if America is Babylon, then the scriptures say it's going to fall. It's going to fall. And the reason it's going to fall is because of its sin. That's why every nation falls. It's because of its sin. America began well. America covenanted with God. Yes, in the beginning, seeds of the enemy were sown here. But America covenanted with God, and God blessed this nation. I mean, we grew to be a mighty nation in the shortest period of time anybody could imagine. But we've turned our back on God. You know, there are still plenty of people who love God with all their heart, soul, strength, and mind. But we're a divided nation. I mean, right now, the Democratic National Convention, what have they done? A couple of years ago, they, they took God off of their platform. Just this year, it became legal to slaughter children right before birth. And now right after birth. It's like going, who in the world thinks that's a good idea? Or sell body parts. It's like, what? You know? The sex trade industry is terrible. Should not ever, ever, ever have happened. And of course, from what I understand, America's por pornographic industry is what has sold, they've sold their smut all over the world. I mean, we're the capital of it. So, you know, America is polluting the world with all kinds of sin and immorality. And what does it say, you know, about the immorality? Here, that gave to drink the Gentiles. 
you know, her immoralities. It's a terrible thing. So I know it doesn't, the, you know, for, it doesn't fit everybody in America, but it, it's enough to say it could be. It could be. And it is God who raises up nations and God who brings them down. And he can only stand sin for so long until it has to be judged. Okay? So, what we've got to do, even if we are Babylon, we've still got to keep our eyes on Jesus. We've still got to cling to our, the faith that we have in him. We've still got to be the work, about the work of our master. We've still got to be doing the things that we know God wants us to do. The church still has to be the church. Because yes, though later on there will be an angel declaring the glad tidings upon the earth and telling the earth to you know, worship God and serve Him, we've got to be doing it too. We've got to be declaring this good news to everybody else. I mean, what's awesome, I think, is that, you know, there may be all kinds of disruption and communications and all kinds of trouble coming upon the earth, but, you know, when you got this angel flying and declaring the glad tidings, God isn't giving up. He wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Since God isn't giving up, we can't give up either. It may get harder to declare this good news, but we've got to keep declaring it because there are an awful lot of lost people in our world. A lot of them. And we need to keep our eyes on what we are called to do. Amen.